Morning everybody, there seems to have been a natural hush in the room, which is always a good time to, uh, to start a breakfast seminar. Um, good morning and, and welcome to our learning legacy session for the, uh, for the Aquatic Centre. Uh, I'm Sean McCarthy, I've got a very easy job today. I, I'm just chairing the event, introducing the speakers and then facilitating a bit of Q&A um, because we've got an awful lot to go through this morning. Uh, I think there's some fantastic lessons to be learned from this project. So I want to crack on as soon as and as quickly as I possibly can. Um, here's a list of the, uh, the speakers that we have today. So I think what you have here um, is the entire story of a sustainable aquatic centre. Um, I, I think the aquatic centre is probably the most technically challenging uh, of projects to deliver on the Olympic Park and certainly the most technically challenging to deliver sustainability. And I think some fantastic work has been done. And you're going to be here from the, hearing from those people who actually did it. Um, they've all been encouraged to speak for 10 minutes, no more, um, to give some time for questions and answers at the end so we can kind of get the, uh, the most possible um, value that we can get out of the, um, <coughs> out of the whole programme. Um, this is me. Uh, I'm chair of the Commission for a Sustainable London 2012. Um, so it's my job to provide strategic assurance over the, the London 2012 programme. Uh, I've been involved in the Olympics programme since the bid. Um, so I actually have a long history in the programme myself. But as I say, the, uh, the purpose today is for me to chair uh, rather than to, uh, to waffle on endlessly. Uh, so I will stop waffling on endlessly. Uh, I'd like a few words, please, if we can, from, uh, from Julian, from Atkins. Uh, and then if each speaker can just come up in turn, uh, we won't waste everybody's time doing introductions. Please just introduce yourselves uh, and, uh, and start saying your piece. And let's have a, uh, a very productive session, I hope. Thank you very much. Um, my own um, Olympic journey started with uh, LOCOG and the Temporary Materials Handbook, which, of course, you can all find out lots about on the 19th of June, so sign up now. Uh, Atkins uh, was delighted to partner with the UK Green Building Council for this series. Uh, it's a great program, uh, full of thought-provoking technical nuggets, uh, which reach out to a lot of people. We've had in excess of 450 people uh, working on 2012 since uh, 2005, and every one of them has a story to tell uh, and a role in the learning legacy. Uh, UK Green Building Council program allows us to share these lessons learned by our technical and project management teams and uh, really at the heart of delivering London 2012. We're committed to the sustainability agenda in the design and engineering industry and we take our responsibility for low carbon future very seriously. We've established ourselves as a leader in, uh, in bringing industry action on climate change and around the subject of carbon. We've got Keith Clark, our just recently passed CEO, out there with the Brunel Lecture, touring the world, talking about carbon and uh, carbon without the rhetoric. We've developed some fantastic multidiscipline carbon tools, uh, and we bring those to all our projects and anyone who really wants to use them. Very useful stuff. And we've been busy designing sustainable colleges, Lois Stoft, one of our recent uh, successes. But over the years, we really have been working very hard to engage with our clients and our peers and our own staff to raise the profile of sustainability in the industry. So we've been busy doing low carbon energy master planning in North London with our friends at LDA, I think there's a couple here. Zero carbon developments in the Middle East down in Bahrain with developer clients, quite a tough, tough market. But every project we want to make sure is more sustainable than the last. And that's pretty much my job to make them more sustainable. But I think the key for us is that sustainability is no longer optional. It's a core skill. Um, we find more and more it's not even identified as a sort of special service. It's something we all have to do. It's synonymous with good design, integrated design, efficient design, low resource solutions. These are all the sorts of words that we find relating to that sustainable environment and the sorts of projects that we're talking about here. So as I said, we started our journey on the Olympics back in 2005 and we've had a really interesting time. Our staff have learned a lot and I guess we would never have guessed that we would help to reuse 80% of the soil on site. We probably never imagined we could recycle over 95% of the demolition materials. We've created over a hectare of new habitat. 
delivered the Remediator Stadium site three months early. You know, all fantastic stories, uh, and we want to tell these stories. So for a true legacy to be left behind, all these lessons need to be shared. And the successes of London 2012 need to become the new benchmark for infrastructure and construction projects. So just as the Olympics have a real true global appeal, so does sustainability lessons learned. So this is our chance as construction professionals around the world to share our best practice, to educate one another and to make sure that we move forward uh, in a positive way. So I get the opportunity to speak to a lot of audiences, which is great, and it is always so easy to talk to people about London 2012. It captivates the imagination of both young and old, local and international. It's a real demonstration, real you know, nuts and bolts, mud and concrete demonstration of sustainable development. So I found the first masterclasses fantastically interesting, absolutely fascinating, and I'm sure the future sessions won't disappoint. We're thrilled to be part of this legacy series and the new look construction industry that we hope will emerge as a result of London 2012. So thank you, enjoy, I'm sure it'll be great. Good morning, it's a pleasure to be presenting the Aquatic Centre today from the uh, fantastic venue on the Olympic Park. Um, I'm, I'm Ian Crockford, the client, effectively, the project sponsor in, um, in uh, government project, public sector project speak. And uh, I'm just going to set the, you know, give, uh, put the project in context of the Olympic Park and uh, give you an introduction of what we did as a client, as the Olympic Delivery Authority today. So, first of all, what are we as the ODA, the Olympic Delivery Authority, and where we fa fitted into the, into the structure? We're, we're here now. That, oh, sorry. I've got to get used to my toggle. This blue box here, uh, closely aligned with our delivery partner, which I'll come on and explain in a minute. But the, the Olympics is a, it's a, it's a huge event. You win it. We won it in 2005. There was that great um, presentation with Jack Frog, and he, everyone thought he was going to say Paris, and he said London. And then you thought, you know, it's one of them jobs, you think, blimey, you know, we've won it, what should we do? And the first thing you have to do is loads of acts of parliament to go through to give you the planning powers and the rights to develop a piece of land. The land we chose in London is a huge swathe of land. There's two, two square kilometres of land, which is, comes very close to the, a city centre. And for a city the size of London, this is a very rare opportunity to regenerate uh, an area of land. But that, that takes a lot of time, and that's where a lot of countries actually fall foul of, uh, of, of the time pressures involved. You know, 2005, you think you've got seven years to deliver the Games, because that's when the, the uh, opening ceremony is going to happen in 2012. Great people can then start arguing about whether it's London or the UK's games, and uh, like they've done in Delhi or India and the Commonwealth Games we've heard about, whether it was in Athens or Greece or what, what now is in Rio or, or Brazil. And, but in London, we were quite switched on. We got that sorted out very quickly, and we set up the ODA by 2006. So by May 2006, we had an organisation called the Organisation Delivery Authority. Bear in mind, though, it's not far off a year after you've made the announcement. At that time, that, oh, I keep pressing the wrong button here. So at that time, the ODA was set up and we had the rights to start developing the site and, and, um, and um, season the businesses on the site. The, um, we then set up a, a, a tender procedure to get a delivery partner on site because we wanted to be a lean and mean um, client organisation. And we needed a huge resource, a flexible resource pool of which to uh, help deliver the project, along with all our contractors and, and, and supply chain designers, obviously. But the delivery partner helped us set the project up. But um, so then we were going. But then you think the first thing we do was say, right, let's get ready and let's try and finish the venues a year before the Olympic Games. So then we're already now 2006 and then we're into 2011 to finish the Games. So we've got a five year development program from basically a blank bit of paper to finish venues. And that's the that's the real challenge. And as well as that, we set up incredible benchmarks. We wanted to use this project to really change the industry and the way it, the way it uh, thought about developing on, on this scale. And I'll just come on to a bit about how we helped, helped us initiate that as a, as a client. But there you can see so the, the IOC, which everyone sort of knows about. They've got a sort of event manager called LOCOG, who uh, basically stays the event. So they're the people who you're buying your tickets off and getting frustrated on your websites and all that. It's nothing to do with us. And we have to just, uh, we have to, what we do is just set that development ready. So we have to develop the site ready for basically the next 50, 60 years of, uh, 
of being a future part of London, of a, of a future community or a future neighbourhood of London. In the meantime, over that 50, 50, 60 year span, there's a little line which says Olympic Games. It's about a six, seven week period and we had to cater for that in the meantime. So think about the Olympic Games is something you have to cater for in the meantime, but our focus was on legacy and getting something regenerating part of London for, for, um, predominantly. So LOCOG, this IOC and LOCOG is all part of you know, London 2012, quite critical, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very short, um, short piece in, in time over the whole development of the project and really what our task was set out to do, which is regenerate this part of London sustainably and for the future. So you can see there we had Olympic Board, which is, you know, there's British Olympic Association, the, the mayor, and um, LOCOG, the event manager and government, just helping manage, get that balance right between the, the future needs of, the, of London and the, and the Olympic Games, and making sure we cater for the Olympic Games in, in adequately. So, as I said, to get a, an area, a site um, this size in London is a very rare opportunity, and, you know, just, uh, just to the south, this is actually south, this is north orientation, the, there's the Olympic Stadium, there's the, uh, the Aquatic Centre there, the, the main boulevard leading into the Olympic Park here on, on the Aquatics Park. Just down here is the dome, so you've got that loop in the river on uh, Greenwich Peninsula. And just further up here you're into Hackney Marshes then onto Epping Forest. So this is going to form a green band through London that didn't exist before. Um, so you can see here the extent of the site and the, uh, and the, and the extent of the development that needs to be done to, uh, to uh, build this new neighbourhood for London. So that's, uh, you know, when you get a site and you've got all these planning power sorted and then you think, right, we're in an OG process, we've got to, we've got to set ourselves up as a client and start procuring um, absolute best in class design and uh, contracting teams to deliver a park. You, th you get that process going in a tender process, then you start looking at the site. And this is the aquatic site in, um, in 2007. It was a, you know, I think it was the Montreal Agreement had a, you know, uh, initiative about, you know, recycling refrigerants more uh, environmentally um, with more environmental awareness, so we started collecting fridges off people's doorsteps and things like that. We didn't actually know what to do with them when we'd taken all the refrigerant out of them, so they were put on this on this site. So this this shows you, you know, the the sort of a, a typical site. And underneath this is a, a lot of heavily contaminated ground. But I'm just going to take you through now just a very quick build process. So within the year we we set up. We're working closely now with the, the designers and the and the and the uh, and the contracting team and the consultants for for building up a design for the aquatic centre. We'd set our brief and we set out a number of initiatives, which we'll come on to a, a little bit further, which including the sustainability development strategy. So that's it, but in the meantime, we're developing the site. So this is cleaning the, la the land on the site. Uh, this is the aquatic centre site here now, so you can see all the fridges have gone. And we're, we're, we're now cleaning uh, contaminated land. We'd actually put two huge, we'd cleaned up, we're, we're getting ready to take the pylons down across the site. You can still see a few here and we've got two huge power networks going underground in this area now we've put uh, a huge tunneling exercise to get the power lines under there there's a new Westfield just to put you into and, and there's the south of the site there's the stadium site so you can see all the riverways we're starting to think about how to clean those up and everything and uh, we're looking at all the bridges and infrastructure and everything we need to put onto the site to make the site work for the future within the next year uh, and I've gone through one yeah that's it within the next year we're actually just starting to, we're on site now and uh, we're building this huge roof, a very, um, very uh, technologically uh, challenging. The team can come onto that, how this is designed um, and uh, constructed a bit. But what we did, we put this 3,200 roof structure, actually a beautiful structure here on a, on a sheer wall and two columns. It's rested on three points, huge spans, very complicated because it's sealed your site away. This is the swimming pools we need to build down the bottom here and all the changing rooms and uh, filtration plant uh, bits go down here but we couldn't do that while we were building the roof. Roof's up, and then here now is an aerial shot, but we're starting in earnest now. We're working flat out underneath that roof, giving us a bit of protection, building the pools, the filtration areas, changing rooms, etc. down in, underneath. But you can see the constrained site. We've got um, railway lines here, riverways here, and uh, it really is big. And you can see the rest of the site, the logistics of controlling the rest of the site as, as we build this. But there you go, you know, within a year, year to go, uh, we achieved the goal, bang on program, this beautiful pool, and, um, and you, you know, you're now seeing it's in its full glory on, on test events uh, for diving and the swimming's next week, um, and then synchro swimming, so the, the, event, uh, the, the venue's performing absolutely fantastically. And then here we are now, with, uh, this, is getting this is all ready operationally now for, um, for test events, so I say. So how do we do it as a client? The first thing we did when we set, it, set ourselves up in 2006 was build that 
really set those benchmarks on how we're going to change the industry and change people's thoughts of how we could develop a site that, of this scale in London. So as well as the health, safety and security, we wanted to set totally new benchmarks in that. Um, equality and inclusion, the, the, you know, the venues we built were, were um, open to everybody to use. But as well as that, we wanted to get um, um, you know, involvement right through the design phase and the build phase from uh, people who don't normally have the, have the opportunities to work in, and, uh, in, on venues such as this. Employment and skills, um, the legacy, okay, was a, a focus went through. Design and accessibility, again, you know, um, all the venues are going to be available to use for, any, for anyone, whatever faith and whatever ability you, ha you had. But key was the sustainability. So we built a, a, um, a sustainability strategy. This, this came out in 2007, very early on in the development. And as I say, as we were working with the, the um, we secured the, uh, the uh, contractor and the, um, and the consultant team here. And this is where, as a client, you're sort of leading the initiatives. You're relying on them to pick these things up and give their own leadership on how they're going to deliver these initiatives. But we just set the targets and set a framework on which we, we wanted the, uh, and a, a, a whole host of uh, topics here on which they wanted to focus. And so as well as those other issues on the health and safety, accessibility, employment and skills, etc., cetera, um, this was an absolute key part of the, uh, the framework on how we we're going to change development in London. So to take these forward and do it in the way we've done it is something that... Uh, it's something now that the world is very, very interested in on these major sports events. You know, it's incredible the worldwide interest um, on, on from, uh, the, but which is now being promoted by UK trade and industry, department trade and industry, all over the world. It's incredible interest in how we've done this job, but we need world class teams to deliver it. And I'm now very pleased to introduce you the world class team that we had on the aquatics team, which is Balfour Beatty, CLM delivery partner, Arab, and uh, I'll hand you over now to Jim Heverin of uh, Zaha Deed Architects. Thank you, Ian. Um, yes, my name is Jim Heaven. Good morning, everybody. Um, we've been involved, Saha Deeds, also since uh, 2004. So everybody's getting up here and saying that. But, um, so we have, and we initially got the commission through a competition. And this is the competition scheme that was put into the bid. And I think quite instrumental in persuading the IOC that London was ready. And that is obviously the scheme that we uh, delivered. And I think, without sounding too defensive, but there has been a lot of talk about the aquatic centre, and particularly the roof, and how heavy it is. And it all starts with people jumping to the conclusion that there's been a lot of missed opportunities on the aquatic centre, basically. But somehow, it's not like the other uh, venues are delivered on the park that Zaha has willfully forced this iconic design on everybody, that we wouldn't relent on it, that we forced it through. I mean, I wish we were that good, basically. But that is not the case, basically. The case is that this is a very difficult site with a very complex brief. And this design has been redesigned substantially to match that and to optimize it and to get the most efficient design that can work for that site and that brief, basically. And the roof part of this overall carbon footprint is quite small, actually, when you look at the totalities, and we'll come on to that later, basically. <coughs> and I think, you know, I mean, we are the first to admit that we are not um, coming into this project. Um, we are not known for our green aspects as architects, but that does not mean that we do not take these issues seriously, that we do not learn lessons from clients that are willing to pursue these types of objectives, and you can integrate them into um, architecture, basically. And that is what we have been looking to do. And um, when we looked at the site, it is, as Ian was pointing out, a very constrained site. It's got the river to the west, as we say. It's got a railway track which was then expanded into a double loop road to uh, the east side. It also has this level difference. So actually, when you look at the field of play arrangements for the venue, I mean, the, the actual brief that the ODA, what they wanted to situate on this site was three swimming pools, a competition area, which had a field of play, which involved the diving pool and uh, the competition pool. And to expand that, to a capacity of 17,500 seating uh, for the Olympics. 
and to reduce it afterwards to a seating capacity of 2,500. Now, when you think about it, when the actual site is so narrow in this direction, you can only lay out the field of play parallel to the river and the railway. You can only then expand the seating in the other direction. And you can only then end up with a column-free requirement for the permanent roof, which sits in the middle and needs to span over 100 meters to create a column-free open view onto the field of play, which is down here, basically. And we were talking about adding 7,500 seats on either side of the field of play in a temporary scenario with sight lines going down onto the field of play with no restrictions from uh, intermediate supports, basically. It is then not possible to think of any other solution but from spanning from that point to that point uh, without columns, basically. But there was no other magical solution out there, basically. There's no magical solution of integrating the seating with the roof structure in this scenario. These seats need to come away. We need to reduce the venue back considerably, over 50% of its footprint after the games, because that is the business case. That is the, the most sustainable part of this project. It's the most sustainable thing that London has been looking at, is that you do not leave a venue 17,500 seats, which nobody will use. Nobody needs it. What people need in London is swimming water. They need pools. They need to use the pools. That is where the engagement with getting more people involved in sport um, comes from. But, <coughs> so when you factor all of those factors in, um, you end up with a design which is very efficient. It is efficient for that site and for that brief. It's, it's, it's easy to talk about greenfield sites and to look at this in the abstract and to compare and to incorrectly compare oranges with apples and et cetera, et cetera. This is not, you have to look at the specifics of this site and think about it and think about where the design came from, basically. And the iconic part, let's, if everybody keeps going on about it, if you talk about the roof, is a small part of it, basically. But actually, most of the work is going on in the basements and in the ground, to actually to be able to create uh, the swimming pools and integrate all of the plant equipment. And there was a lot optimized. I mean, underneath that bridge element, you have one of the pools. So the training pool was integrated underneath a bridge. So you have the kind of dual functionality of this bridge, which allows you access into the park, and then the integration of a pool underneath it. The pool ends up being a black box. So that actually poses a problem in terms of how do you create a space which people will actually want to swim in, basically. And we'll come on to that in a bit. But <coughs> so the actual design looked to integrate these things as much as possible. And when we look at the overall embodied energy in the scheme, you're looking there at 87% of the embodied energy of the project. And that doesn't have uh, the legacy roof, which sits in the center. The legacy roof is only 13% of the overall embodied energy. And if you take the fact that to span from there to there requires a truss solution, we looked at timber, we looked at concrete, we even looked at the, the glorious cable structures, but they do not work with the scenario that we had of spanning from there to there to create this open, column-free vision onto the field of play. We also looked at an arch solution, so a much higher volume in the center. Um, it is more efficient structurally, but actually what it leaves is a larger legacy volume. So then you have the argument, well, actually, you're going to spend more energy in use heating the space because um, you want to save on the carbon footprint of the structure. So it was felt that to, do, um, to not do the arch solution, but to actually go for more compressed, lower volume in the center would actually leave a more manageable um, volume for legacy and lower energy and use costs in terms of the running of the venue. But the majority of what you're looking at there is over 60% of the embodied energy is in concrete. It's a site where it has a, because the water is here, there's a very high water table. So actually the, the, the problem with the pools, when you're digging down five meters for the dive pool, three meters for the competition pool, you actually have the issue that the pools will float because there's so much upward pressure. So you have to have a lot of tension piles. You have the tunnels that Ian was talking about you have to actually bridge over those tunnels with the piling. And then we actually looked at, because initial designs had all of the plant equipment in the basements, 
that was lifted up to make it more uh, cost effective, um, you end up with a very compressed and efficiently planned uh, podium element uh, which is made predominantly in concrete. And so if you, if you look at that the main embodied energy is in the concrete, we really, I mean, we did look at optimizing the steel structures. We did um, study that this steel structure, which actually has more steel tonnage than the legacy roof, um, could have been made with a combination of bespoke steel work to try and deal with the complexities of the site and then an off-the-shelf uh, scaffolding system above it. That was studied there. That was an option that was quite late in the procurement and the construction when we changed because actually the buyback wasn't working out financially and we had to switch to an all steel solution. But these options were there and they were studied basically. There weren't opportunities lost at all. Um, but we, <coughs> the concrete was the area where I think we got the most innovation. It is our biggest um, amount of embodied energy. And I think we were at the front pretty much across the park in leading the concrete in terms of recycled aggregates and reducing the cement and actually getting a concrete that is coming out to very, very exacting fair face um, requirements. And, and for us, I mean, that is the overall benefit of the integrated team that was set up by the client and uh, working with Balfour Beatty and Arabs, is that in the end, you produce a quality building that will last. And lasting quality is one of the most important aspects of sustainability for us, something that actually goes on for generations. And just a, probably a paraphrasing Einstein, but, it, but it's true that you can get obsessed with counting in the, when you're talking about sustainability and efficiency, and it's all about numbers. And you lose the, the basic fact that there is other things that you cannot put onto a schedule, you cannot put onto a tracker, and they are issues that need to be factored into this, that you create buildings that balance the well-being aspect and engagement with the community and users and are actually quality spaces which will last. I'm Michael Steitch, I work for Arup. I was one of the project leaders on this and the project's going on because there's more to do. And I'm going to, Arup designed uh, the engineering across the board. I'm gonna focus a bit on the structure, tell you a bit about that tell you a bit about environmental systems because pools are all about energy and use uh, when it comes to engineering and, and the long-term view that Jim was talking about. And then I've highlighted some, some of the successes, challenges, and, and, um, and some of the lessons learned. So my overview, my overview is to just pick out some of the things that, that were recurring. So when we started this project back in, I mean, you know, in terms of getting on with the design, say 2006, uh, the designing for legacy is a really serious point. So everyone talks about it, but in everything that we did, it was all about getting the legacy building and then adding the games uh, mode in, in, a, in a very temporary way. So. What, that me what that's meant in practice is we have a building that is structurally complete and then we, we effectively have to do very little when it comes to September after the games. We have to take things away and put the facade in, but effectively the systems are commissioned and things are ready to go. And that was, that was absolutely, absolutely key. Pool environments compared to any other uh, building are very, they're very different. So that you have to keep the air temperature very warm so you're at 29, 30 degrees. Uh, you have this big body of water that you have to deal with in terms of the environment. And making that comfortable, making it beautiful, uh, and making people want to be there and love it was actually, again, one of the key focuses at the beginning of the project. And then getting into more of the sort of, more of the, the sort of nitty gritty, the material specifications, which uh, others will talk about uh, later on. But again, pool environments, they're corrosive. How do we reduce that? How do we get materials that are robust? So you see all that concrete, that's actually a very robust material with low maintenance for the long term. The site constraints, well, Ian and Jim have talked about those and how we've dealt with those. I'll talk about that a little bit. The energy strategy, the pool is a big consumer of energy. It just, it is, regardless of, uh, of, of, of what it is or what its shape is. How can we make that a significant part of the site-wide strategy so that the site-wide systems can make the best use of, of what we're doing in the pool and the other way around? So it's linking buildings with site. Of course, reducing water consumption, 
big water user pools. Um, and actually, in terms of water, uh, there's a sort of default position with pools where you, you say you're going to use X amount of water. But actually, the real win in water is when the operator is on board. How, how can they really reduce demand? The, the pools aren't going to be absolutely full all the time. How can, you, how can you reduce demand in that sense? Because by far, the pool water makeup makes up the most of the water use for the, for the building. I just say a little bit about Briam. Briam was one of the targets uh, for the buildings. They're all, they're majority, I think, I don't know if all of them are, are excellent. I think Briam gets a bit of bad press. I think on this project and in the park, what it meant was that people were talking about sustainability from the beginning because you have to deal, Briam makes you deal with numbers, makes you make comparisons. And it is frustrating at times, but it, it's all about raising the, the bar for all buildings, not just having one or two nice little things, uh, uh, gems but about raising the bar. And I think it, it did bring that to our project um, through to construction and also in design. And, and, and even now, going back into buildings and measuring again. So, so that, that was a big, a big part of the, a big part of the, of the beginning of the, of the project. So the roof is, I'll say about the roof and the podium in terms of structure. So it's 120 meter span. And it's basically built so that we, it's basically designed so it can be built simply. It looks complicated, the geometry is complicated, the connections are, of course, um, tricky. But the solution that we went for in the end was that we could get the roof up. It, we knew how to do it um, without too much connection to the ground. So you saw the picture that Ian showed, uh, which effectively meant the roof went up on its, on its three piers. Um, it's, it's a series of trusses. There are six trusses that span across, and then there are these wings. Uh, which um, there is some uh, the, to reduce the load on those. There is some, there is a tie across the, the roof to, to to keep it compact, and it, it, you know sustainability is all about really driving efficiency, not just having one big idea and, and forgetting about it. It's about looking at everything. So in in this design, each bit of steel is is is, is made more and more efficient, uh, and really really driving the tonnages um, down. And again, the main reason for this span and the one-way span is so that we can get the stands column-free on either side. So that's why we, there are no other supports around, uh, around, the, around the, um, the structure. And then, as Jim was saying, actually most of the structure and uh, a lot of the complexity is in the podium. Um, pools, I'd never designed a pool before, um, are extremely complicated uh, things to design. Uh, and you can see even in here, the pool tanks, there's a lot of uh, cast in for drainage. There's all sorts of uh, elements. The, the fact that the pool has to be 50 meters, not 50.01 meters, or that the diving pool has to be 10 meters exactly, is absolutely critical. And so uh, you know, a lot of the effort goes into making this work and making the pools absolutely perfect for Olympics, but then for later in, in legacy mode. Any other thing I, I want to say about the, the um, the podium structure is that one of the big moves uh, of consolidation was, as Jim said, to move the training pool under the bridge. And effectively, we've got a bridge that's 120 year life, which connects to uh, the two, two contact points at that point. And then we've got our building, which starts, that's, that's a, um, a movement joint. And then there are no other movement joints beyond that. And that's a 60 year life, that's a building. And the pools effectively sit underneath. And what you see here is uh, transfer structure over these uh, plug tunnels, which are the which are carrying high voltage cables, and one of the big successes, and of course you don't see it, is uh, the piles. Um, the the base case with the checkers for for all these tunnels was to take the piles almost double the the depth, and there was a lot of ground engineering done to show that actually we didn't need to do that. We didn't affect the movement so much of these tunnels, and that that meant that we took the piles to the 20 23 meters that they are. And also, we were allowed to pile then um, below the tunnels. And that avoided a huge volume of concrete on the ground. And it's those kind of things. It's sort of really looking at everything very closely. So how does how did the building work? Well, it, it is a big volume. Um, this is the reduced volume. This is the legacy. The temporary stands come up here. And of course, we're not going to try and heat the whole space. Ridiculous. You know, why, why would you try and do that? And that is often the default position. So, we thought, how do we deal with this volume? Um, and the first thing we looked at very carefully was what's the heat loss from this environment, um, from this building? And what we've designed is a very, very well insulated building. We've got 200 mil in continuous insulation on the roof. There's very few cold bridges. Uh, we then, we've insulated some of the tanks and some of the basement. 
And actually what came out a lot of the learning in this is that it's often the things you don't think about that become the, the, the higher, uh, sort of the, the bigger factors. So infiltration of cold air is one of the big, big points, not, not so much the heat loss. So we worked very carefully on the joints between the facades and sealing the building so that we could really reduce that. So when it comes to the systems, effectively what we've de designed is, uh, because in legacy use, it, you know, expect it, there won't be events every day. Uh, the pool will be occupied only, I don't know, 20, 50%. So what we've designed is a series of systems that allow us to run just the system we need to deal with that occupancy, and that's a huge savings uh, in energy. So there's a system around the pool, there's a system for spectators, so that's off most of the time. And then there's a separate system in the facade, which is effectively just water pipes in the mullions that keep the facade from, um, keeps condensation of the facade and keeps the heat loss uh, away from the facade. So it's not so much about the volume, it's about dealing with the systems and making it uh, a really tight, tight space. What that means is in games mode, uh, we could run and we are running these base systems and they are running as they will be in the future. Uh, when we insert the temporary stands, they're not affecting that so much. And that meant, actually, because the games is in the summer, we pretty much naturally ventilate both these two uh, temporary stands throughout the entire period of the games and Paralympics. At the moment, there's a screen here for test events that's shrunk the volume down, and we're running some heating systems to deal with that. Um, but, uh, but effectively, uh, it, was, it, was a, it, it was a case of building for legacy and then dealing with this in a very temporary way. Compared to other, I haven't got too many graphs, I, I, I'll assure you, that compared to most other buildings, I mean, pools use about 10 times the amount of energy that, say, an office does. And, that, and that's sort of, most of it is in heating. And just to, the, up to that red line, is, that's all, that's all en energy in, used in heat. And a lot of these are fixed, you know, the showers, domestic hot water use, pool water treatment heating, which is where I was saying the operators can really drive that down by looking very closely at how much water they churn through the pools. But I mean, the pool hall heating is only this bit here. So the idea that it's all of that is, is, is just not, not true. Um, so the idea is to really drive these things down. And then the electrical energy used, we can see there's a lot of water pumping. Again, something that we can really drive down because we've given the facility for operators to, to do that. Uh, and then a little bit of lighting, small power and auxiliary. Actually, one thing I didn't mention is the lighting energy is very efficient because in legacy, the pool is completely daylit. And just to compare it, I think it's important to compare buildings with other buildings that are the same rather than uh, different. And um, this is just comparing other pools in the UK and where we sit in, in carbon terms. So um, I'm running out of time, I know. Uh, so successes, well, we talked about this already. The phase design for games and legacy, the integration of the training pool, the sufficiency of the PARs and foundations. We've met the ODA targets. We've, we've driven a lot, a lot of that, um, leading a lot of that, particularly in sort of materials, the temporary stands and the pool hall environment and how we've dealt with that. Challenges, well, the site talked about. Uh, again, I mean, it, you know, how tight is all that? And uh, although as engineers we enjoy these challenges, there, there are many to deal with there. The roof, keeping the visibility, and then the tech requirements for the pools. And just to mention, that's really where we're operating a pool and UK climate is down here, so we're having to heat all the time. So natural ventilation, for example, wouldn't, wouldn't be the right choice. And then just to finish off, some lessons learned. Uh, it's a general statement, but very collaborative working uh, throughout the entire project, um, through, between contractor, all the designers, uh, the client. I mean, it, it really was um, good. In terms of what we've learned as a, in terms of the engineering is the amount of emphasis uh, and we've placed on analysis and really good analysis that we can we can get real design solutions from uh, concrete mixes are now our base specification we did a lot of 3d working on this project which reduced a lot of the complexity for us a lot of more sharing of, of information and then lastly really understanding where the energy winds really are i think was very important and I'll just, I'll just finish with this. I, I know um, Julian said it as well at the beginning, but sustainability is just, it's, just yeah, it's good design. It's looking at everything and seeing it through from the beginning to the end. But the big ones would be the temporary stands, our um, involvement with the supply chain and the design team to come up with a sustainable solution as uh, um, Jim and uh, Michael Steich mentioned. 
uh, and also uh, the type of uh, timber ceiling which has been chosen. In the end, we've uh, managed to save 50% of the uh, hardwood which was meant to be procured for uh, doing the uh, timber cladding. Through the construction, uh, we have been one of the first contractors on site, so we uh, couldn't go to other contractors and ask, how have you done this, how you, have you done that, how can we implement um, the ODA um, sustainability strategy uh, and how we can um, make everyone aware of what is expected from us. So we've had to come up with um, systems and we had to uh, make sure that our team, um, whatever role they were doing, are uh, up to speed with what is required and um, we have tried to develop a system which would um, deliver uh, our objectives and targets um, set up for the project. So one of the um, things which, have tr which we have tried was the first, um, we were the first contractor using uh, um, a concrete mix design with high recycled content. It hasn't been trialed. Everybody was, uh, we uh, want to see how that went. And when they were appointed, they've been appointed to us to come and uh, share the knowledge and what the challenges were. Also, um, with the GGBS <coughs> content, um, in the fair face concrete, there was a lot of work being done by the design architects and uh, our um, supply chain and ourselves and uh, to come up with um, a concrete mix design which will deliver what the architect wanted. Um, also, we were the first uh, venue to have a phthalate-free PVC wrap. Um, we've worked with our supply chain and make sure that we um, tr selected the healthier materials. We had to uh, make sure our material management was um, working well. We had to bring in uh, a lot of um, material to um, construct the piling platforms, uh, about 160,000 tons of uh, recycled aggregates, and then we had to take that away and find a way of reusing recycling on site. Also, we managed to achieve BRIAM excellent, um, although in our contract was to achieve a BRIAM very good, so we worked really hard with the design team and the architect and the client um, in uh, making sure that we are going above and beyond if we can. And we had another um, target in um, assessing the F10 bridge, uh, which is, forms part of the aquatic center under the SQL scheme, and we achieved very good. So because there were loads of objectives and targets, our team didn't know where to start and how to implement things um, and how um, they can uh, incorporate the sustainability aspects of the uh, project in their job role. So I came up with this um, sustainability action plan, which has been developed on each work package and we set up clear objectives and targets. So each package manager would take this forward and um, they would be able to um, understand what the objectives and targets were uh, as part of the design, what can be done in procurement when um, we engage with the uh, tenderers and the supply chain, what questions we need to ask and how we can um, improve our performance. And also through the construction, when the construction managers takes over that work package, we would like him to know where, um, where we've left it from the uh, procurement stage and what needs to be delivered. So it's kind of a process which would allow us to trace from the design to the construction what has been done for that work package. And this is a good way of making sure that um, our contractors fully understand what their obligations are and um, is not going to confuse them with loads of other ob objectives and targets which maybe are not relevant to them. <coughs> So uh, in our view, this worked really well, and um, we've managed to um, have uh, quite a lot of successes um, in 
selecting healthier materials, we came up with a good solution on the timber ceiling instead of using Brazilian hardwood uh, inside the building. We came up with um, plywood uh, with a hardwood veneer, which reduces the um, hardwood <coughs> by 50%, the need of hardwood by 50%. Also, the, the insulation used um, inside uh, the building was environmentally friendly. Um, this was specified in the uh, design specification, which was really good. Um, the trials and the hard work which has been done on identifying the concrete mix designs, uh, you can see this has been um, done uh, on site. Uh, the uh, the uh, concrete mix has been um, trialed before we actually um, done the dive board and um, this is the complexity of the steel work which has to go in to get that nice and curvy shape um, so we had loads of challenges in getting the finish required and making sure we get it right first time um, and for uh, this work we have been um, given a premium innovation credit in um, um, the fact that we've used for the first time a, a cement replacement uh, in the fair-faced concrete mix design. Also, uh, we've engaged with the community. We had loads of joint uh, um, activities with other contractors on the Olympic Park, and we tried to uh, make a positive impact on the local um, community. We've chosen um, schools from the uh, five local boroughs, and we went and see them and um, allowed them to come to our site and show them what um, ODA and the Olympic Park is doing. Um, also, uh, we I felt that uh, we need to make everyone aware on um, what means sustainability, what has been done through the design, because when we are appointed as a construction team, we kind of don't spend too much time in looking back and uh, seeing what others have done and what studies have been done. So it was a good way of understanding where it started and how we can make improvements. This is just to show what we had to deliver, loads of objectives and targets, and. Uh, the green column the, what is the, shows what the project achieved. So we managed to achieve all our objectives and targets. Um, the challenges I've mentioned earlier, earlier uh, it was the timing of appointing us. We had just two months to prepare and um, get um, on site. Um, also, it was the time and effort which we spent in uh, choosing the concrete mix design which would give us the confidence that the finish required is achieved. And also um, the, the fact that we worked in a contaminated land environment. So we had to um, make sure that the material which we use um, is not going to affect the remediation uh, strategy of the site. Lessons learned. We've learned a lot, I think. Um, we. Um, know that the best outcomes um, are attained just working together with the client design team and our supply chain and setting up uh, clear objectives and targets um, and make sure that our supply chain really understands the importance of what the project tries to achieve. Also, I think the, in the tender stage, we need to make sure that the sustainability um, objectives and targets are um, addressed and um, discussed very early on. And also, uh, we need to make sure that we increase awareness within our team in um, what sustainability means and how they can contribute to um, the project <coughs> performance. Things we w which we'll take away, um, we um, started to we are uh, implementing the um, systems which we de developed on the aquatics on other projects. And uh, I think um, we have set up the benchmark um, within our um, company in the way we should address sustainability from now on. So um, I think that's me. 
Thank you very much, uh, Kirsten Henson. I spent uh, four years working for the CLM Delivery Partner, the partnership that uh, Ian set out right at the beginning there in terms of actually taking the strategy and working with designers and trying to deliver it um, on the ground, which was one of the challenges. I think what you've heard today, this is actually one of my favourite projects on the park because it's not outwardly sustainable. Everybody has mentioned a lot of the criticism that the Aquatic Centre has faced, but I hope what you've heard today, it's not about justifying the design. It's actually about explaining the, the, the constraints. It is about justifying the design. It's about justifying the design. You can't say it's not. I mean, that's, that's not... OK, so, but, but the point is you have to understand the context in which the design was developed and how it came about. And I think the reason why I like this venue so much is because of the learning that has been developed from the seven years. Everybody has gone away and learned something. You've got uh, Jim from Zaha sort of saying, actually, we have learned on this and we have understand, understood new innovations and the importance of sustainability. We want to work with clients. Evelina, you know, representing the largest construction uh, company in the UK, is now saying, we've learned something, we've done something differently, we've introduced processes and systems within our organisation that is going to change the way that we procure and construct. So the sustainability influence of this venue goes far beyond the venue itself and reaches further out into the legacy, which is actually the industry. So a little bit of an overview in terms of CLM Delivery Partner, and um, I, I guess the key here was that the CLM Delivery Partner set out to be an informed client. Um, we, we did a lot of work on design briefs, setting the sustainability agenda, uh, design guidance, and again, I, I hope you sort of picked up the, the, the disconnect in timing when Ian said, you know, 2004, Zaha Adids are appointed and start design. 2007, the Sustainable Development Strategy came out. By the end of 2007, seven, we finally had got our design guidance in place. This is a learning exercise for all of us. We weren't ready to go right from the outset. We don't know sustainable solutions and what that actually means. Over the last sort of seven or eight years working on this project, we've developed some fantastic tools and systems and processes to aid that learning. We weren't, we weren't perfect from the start, hands up. You know, we did our best, everybody learned. So the design guidance came through in 2000, uh, at the end of 2007, early 2008, and what this tries to do was take those sustainability objectives and very, very explicitly and clearly state what the expectations were from our design teams in terms of measuring, in terms of innovation, how to identify opportunities. Very, very explicit about what we wanted them to deliver at which REBA design stages. Really important when you've got 20 contractors all developing on the same venue, if we have to build up these figures into one recycled aggregate figure for the whole park, one energy efficiency figure for the whole park, everybody has to be reporting in the same format so that we can coordinate all of that, um, all of that data. Technical support, this, this was critical. It's no good just setting a strategy and saying, well, it's written, it's there. Off you, off you go, do it. The point is about this collaborative learning and the collaborative team. Going down the blind alleys together, turning around and finding the solution, throwing, throwing you know, what might be a curveball and seeing, seeing uh, what the solution is to respond to it. Reporting procedures, a challenging one. I see my friend uh, Gary at the back, who uh, I think, who... Uh, he was very big on processes, and a lot of us, when we get involved in sustainability, we want to just sort of roll our sleeves up and get on with it. But actually, reporting is so important to identify missed op where we're about to miss an opportunity so that we can respond to it quickly. Reporting has to be efficient, it has to be concise, and it has to be timely in order for us to, to be able to respond. You know, it's no good getting to the end of the project and going, oh, by the way, we only achieved 21% recycled aggregate, sorry missed you 25%. Oh, by the way, we forgot to uh, install the six litre per minute taps. We've got nine litres per minute, but it'll be all right, right? You know, that's not acceptable. So it is about this um, ongoing reporting and engagement. And of course, the assurance process, a lot of site inspections, uh, audits, and that side of things. So we really provided the structure, I guess, for success. Um, but really, it, I've, I'll say it again, it has been said a lot, it's the integrated team that delivered um, the actual opportunities. You can have all the processes in the world, but until you actually sort of get out there and um, uh, work together to make it happen and face the challenges, you'll get nowhere. 
The successes, um, Evelina mentioned a few of them around the uh, identification of early risks and opportunities. The timber hardwood ceiling, for example, before even Balfour Beatty came on board, we did have this concept that we wanted it to be, or Zaha's had this concept that it was a Brazilian red lauro. We went out very early in the, uh, uh, to uh, a company called Rainforest Alliance who sort of said, guys, actually, there's not enough for FSC, Brazilian red lauro, in the, in the world to meet this demand. Because we found that out early enough, the guys were able to develop a solution that retained the original design intent, and it is an absolutely beautiful timber. It creates a fantastic finish to the pool hall environment without the concern of having unsustainable uh, red lauro uh, timber or any timber on, on the project itself. Um, they really set the bar in sustainable procurement as well. Evelina talked about the sustainability action plans and this idea of engaging the supply chain early and inviting innovation from the supply chain. It's amazing how few people actually ask their suppliers or communicate with their suppliers what their intentions are around sustainability. If you do it early enough, they will respond and they will respond in a cost effective manner because it becomes part of the tender process. I'm not saying you've won the job and by the way, can you do X, Y and Z please? That's always going to cost you more in terms of sustainability. If it becomes integrated as part of the, the process, the suppliers will respond with fantastic innovations. At the end of the day, Morris Rowe know concrete better than I do, better than Balfour Beatty do, better than Zaha Hadid do, because that's their core business. That's what they do. They pour concrete. So if you want to work in terms of challenging concrete mix designs, get your concrete contractor involved. Get the concrete supplier in involved. Get your formwork supplier involved and look at your form release agents. It's about getting all of these people together in one room to deliver the outcome. And I think, to me, the biggest success actually is, is, is beyond this. It's the culture change. And if I can tell you a story, um, I quite like my stories. The first time I met um, Balfour Beatty's design manager, a very dour Scotsman, Ron Moore, fantastic man. But he'd obviously been given this incredible challenge of a building to deliver. Um, and I sort of waltzed in and said, right, let's start talking about sustainability, you know, and what are we going to do? It wasn't top of his agenda. But we worked together, step by step, Evelina and myself, and we pushed. We pushed them when the time was right. We introduced opportunities when the time was right. He took them away to his design team, Zaha Hadid, Arabs, and slowly we created these opportunities. A year ago, I went back to uh, Balfour Beatty's uh, Friends and Family Day. And it was a great day. They showed us around the pool hall. Everybody had, uh, all of the design managers, uh, sorry, all of the management team had their own little bit to talk about. And I walked into this pool hall, which is absolutely breathtaking. It's, it's cathedral-like. I mean, it, it really is out, uh, an outstanding piece of design. Ron Muir was there. He had 15 minutes to talk to the congregation about the pool hall design. He spent roughly 12 of those minutes talking about the sustainability of the temporary stands. I thought, I'll have a little bit of fun here. And I said, Ron, what the bloody hell happened to you? What is it, all this talk of sustainability? And he actually turned around to me and said, Kirsten, the thing is, this is a new dimension to what I do every day. This is a design manager who has 30 years worth of experience, who has 40 odd design managers working beneath him. And he's had a realisation through this process that there is a different way of doing things. Now, that's really exciting in terms of lessons learned and legacy, sustainable legacy out of the aquatic centre that somebody has really got innovation and ideas for their jobs. The challenges, I'm not, I, I mean, we sort of, the guys have talked about this, the complexity of construction, the legacy transformation. I think one of the biggest challenges perhaps was... Um, the risk adverse nature of industry. We don't like to do things differently. And it can be quite a challenge. But at the same time, contractors particularly understand risk. So now if you start to sell sustainability in terms of program risk, cost risk, health and safety risk, you're talking a language that they understand. I'm not talking carbon footprinting or anything like that. You've heard today that these guys are perfectly eloquent in carbon footprinting. But in terms of getting that engagement, you really have to talk the right language and what they're interested in and what they understand. I, it amused me when uh, Jim sort of put up there that the, uh, the architects, some things can't be countered, but they count. And whilst the engineer says, we like Brian because it's got tick boxes and it's countable. 
So that just gives you this idea of communicating in forms that people understand, and it's a different forms of engagement. Um, barriers between tender and delivery. Just because the tender wants, the, just because the response to the tender was sustainable, doesn't mean that the guys actually delivering it on site are aware of what they've signed up to deliver. So it's really important that you help make that connection um, as a as a client. Procurement's a vital aspect. Practical approach to sustainability. Never miss the opportunity for a water cooler chat. You've got to build those relationships and get in there. And innovation, as we've heard with the concrete, can actually take quite a lot of time and perseverance. So in terms of the key takeaway for industry, it's about making sustainability simple and the importance of being an informed client. Don't set the strategy and work, walk away. Set the strategy, have the technical support, the guidance, build the collaborative relationships, check that it's happening. And that way, hopefully, we can make progress in sustainability and deliver sustainable venues. And right, right over on the far end there. Thank you. Sorry, I can't hear you, Patsy. <laughs> I've got a microphone. We have a microphone. Bear with us a moment. <laughs> Hello, Hattie Hartman from the Architects Journal. This is a question for Jim and perhaps Kirsten as well. I'm wondering now, sort of looking back on it all, if there are things you might have done differently, number one. And number two, how has this experience filtered into other projects in the office? And would we have done things differently? I don't think so. I don't think we missed the opportunities. I think that's why I started with that statement. Um, we're, for, even in 2004, it was in the ODA brief that the spectator seating capacity we, would be dismantled, basically, and taken away. And that is the most sustainable aspect. It was there from the beginning. The difference was between the 2004 scheme and the major redesign we took after um, the ODA had worked with EDO to relook at the master plan was that we didn't cover those temporary seats with a permanent roof. We actually reduced the roof by well over 50%, basically, and we integrated one of the pools underneath a bridge, basically. And all of that work was done by the ODA. So the ODA was very much focused on creating a brief which had the idea that you had a legacy building um, that was you know, designed for what the community and elite training requires rather than a spectator sport, which swimming isn't beyond the Olympics. It's a unique um, spectator activity during the Olympics, but afterwards it's participation. It's actually three pools at already tripling, or not, well, doubling the amount of 50 meter pools at London has. So, and then when you look at the layout of the field of play on site, there is no options. I mean, in the 2004 competition, people were twisting the pools. The other day. We did all of those variations afterwards. It just doesn't work. The site is not wide enough. They have to go parallel to the river. Then you have to you know, expand the seating in the opposite direction, and you end up with a clear span uh, structure down the middle, basically. And all of that is, and we looked at the structure. And like I said, in the end, that structure only accounted for 13% of the embodied energy. And if you take out, let's say, the expressive, the iconic element, um, you're still probably looking at 10% that had to be there to do that type of span, basically. So, uh, no, I think we, we really worked hard um, to make this project work for that site and this brief, basically. I mean, in terms of what we learned, I mean, we obviously were always aware of uh, sustainability aspects, um, but you know, obviously you have to have a client who's interested in taking those forward. We have the other key parameters of budget and program and the core brief to deliver, basically, and you have to have that balanced. I mean, of course, for us, because we do a lot of Fairface and we have done a lot of Fairface on other projects, to be able to do it with 50% less spent at a high degree of recycled aggregates well, it was fantastic that we actually, like Mike said, Arabs have taken that as their standard specification, so have Zaha's, basically. So we were looking to do that. And, um, and we've learned a lot from that process. And we've learned a lot from, obviously, the Briam process as well, basically. OK, keen to move on. Gentlemen there. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm Brad Bennett of Bennett's Associates, and I should, I should declare an interest. I had a competition entry in the aquatics competition back in 2004 as well. Um, I mean, I think it's 
I think some interesting lessons have come from this and are not entirely as was presented. I mean, you, you could argue that sustainability was actually added after the design was done. Um, I mean, three years later, to be fair. And sustainability, in fact, with the scale of the scheme that you had at the competition stage, was really not really possible. I mean, it was a much, much bigger scheme than you've got now. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's also possible to say that the contracting side wasn't added until much later on. The contractor was not allowed to influence the design, and so there's a big failure there. And in addition to that, of course, the costs went up from a budget at the competition stage of 70 million to something like a tender place order number of something like 430 million. I don't know what the final figure is, but if that's a reflection of how big the building is or how expensive the effort was to make that building, then that's a pretty, dr pretty dramatic figure. Now, the consequence of that, of course, is Government is now using projects like this to say contractors should be in the driving seat on design. Look at the velodrome is what we're hearing in the industry all the time. Much simpler, much lighter, much more economic, quicker to build and all the rest of it. Whereas uh, design done here and sustainability and contracting expertise added later has turned out to be extremely expensive. Ooh, a number of points in there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for that. Ian, can I maybe ask you to lead off? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, the design started, or well, the design competition started as a new 50-metre pool for London. Okay, so, and there was always that caveat that if we had the Olympics, things would change. So, we're comparing, you know, in, in some extent, comparing one scheme with something dramatically different. And so the reason that, you know, I explained at the start the 2006 timeline and getting formed, to, sorry, the 2005 winning the Games to 2006 getting organised as the ODA, that was when we got organised as a client and that was when 2007 we had the, the um, sustainability framework came out. By that time we were working closely with the contractor and, these, and the design team you see in for, for us. Before us we were working through, a, the, through all the RIBA stages, A, B, C, through to uh, a stage D, which was March 2008, when the contract was, um, the design team were innovated to the contractor and the contract was finally awarded. Then there was a clear budget. The budget was nothing like what you said. And, um, and we've stuck to that budget and delivered it on, to, on that budget. So I think there's, there's, you, we're mixing, you, you can mix a lot of things. You know, I know that, you know, that these projects are, you know, they're, they're really in the public eye. There's a lot of, you know, there's been incredible press media interest and there's a lot of people um, leading back to those days of 2004 and the early early days, but there is not, we're not comparing apples for apples, as, as Jim said. I think we've got to be careful of when the brief was set, when this client was formed, when, when things changed dramatically, because we're catering for then a very real Olympic day, Games with a very real um, huge development site in which this is one venue that sits in that, and, um, and, and a very real timeline, a deadline difference. And I think you know what should be celebrated is that we've achieved a, a fantastic design. It's taken on board incredible sustainability uh, credits on it. It was delivered on time and on budget, and uh, it's been outside in the, in the absolute intense scrutiny of the media and the public eye. And there's hardly been any negative press at all uh, about it. And that you know that's a credit to everyone involved in this, in this, in this, um, and the project and the scheme. So I think just we got to just be careful about what we're comparing with. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very easy to say to knock things, but really, you know, there's a lot of successes we should be celebrating here. Can I add to that, Ian? I think mm -hmm. there, there is no shame when we went to, te to bid for the London 2012 Games, it was about legacy and everything that you've heard from Jim, the sustainability aspect at that tender stage very early on in 2004 was about legacy. The sustainable development strategy, it took time to develop, it came out in 2007. What you see is an incredible flexibility and response from the team to then respond to the developing sustainability agenda. It's very easy in 2012 to look back now and say it was the wrong starting point. We learn. What frustrates me is if we don't admit that we have learned and we don't recognise that learning, you don't pass on these lessons to, to, to the community, to the industry. And we have a real... We like to point fingers, we like to... Um, accuse people of doing the wrong thing, which actually prevents people from standing up and saying, we've learnt, as part of this process, we've learnt, we've developed, we're moving forward, we've changed uh, some of our ideas, some of our procurement processes. And I think we have to make sure that we develop an environment in which learning is possible and not sort of considered to be a failure. Okay, can I just ask Evelina to comment about the, the remark about early contractor involvement? Because... That was very much part of your presentation. What's your view on that? And then we'll, we'll move on. Thank you. 
Yeah, I think it would, would have been a benefit to be involved in the very early stage of the design, but um, I think we've uh, responded well to get on with the job um, when we were appointed and we were trying to maximize mm. the opportunities and work together with the, the architect and the design team. There were <coughs> loads of um, objectives and targets which were set up uh, park-wide and uh, we had to digest those quickly and come up with a response and see how we can implement them in making sure that we are not going to miss our opportunities. So from our point of view, uh, I think we've done everything we could have done and we've explored all the avenues and we've engaged with our supply chain and everyone to make sure that uh, we are not going to uh, be in 2012. Um, here um, you say that we could have done something better so I think we've done all we could. Okay thank you and the next question please Paula. We have a microphone just down here. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Hi good morning. Um, Paula Hurst, uh, Mazar, I, um, I have a question about the social and economic um, side of sustainable development. You've talked a lot about environmental issues and talked a lot about carbon. Really interested to understand how the design has developed in order to be able to optimise its use for local communities in the legacy phase. Okay, I can do that. Okay, I can answer that, Paul. Yeah, there's very complex design-wise, but very complex to, uh, to fit in with a local demographic, such as we have in London, particularly East London. Um, extensive consultation early on in the design phase looking at all the needs of various faith groups and, um, uh, and just the, the local needs of the population. I mean, I think uh, this pool, we didn't actually highlight it out, but that bridge thoroughfare, the platform that goes on, it's called the F10 Bridge, which got on it, just local renamed it some Olympic Walkway or something. Um, underneath that bridge platform sits the 50 metre, uh, what we call the training pool, which is the 50 metre community pool, another you know, two metre deep, 50 metre pool with fully flexible, with moving booms and floors. Um, that's it's basically uh, it's got the potential to seal itself off totally from from view from anyone else from the public it's got uh, changing areas where one group could use the pool and then get changed in total privacy while another group is is actually using the pool and all these things aid thorough use of the of the of the of the pool water and they've caused problems in particularly in London um, but in problems in, in other pools so where uh, you know the the use from different different um, either faith groups or people with different abilities have, has, not, has not been possible due to the makeup of the pool. So we've done um, as again it's down to the extensive consultation and then addressing all those needs of the local population to make sure this pool's um, you know, well used. Again, we're doing uh, consultation with operators, looking at the needs for you know we've got a five meter, six metre deep um, dive pool and uh, the floor on that raises to a nine hundred mil. It can raise to just about zero if you want, if you want to do a kiddie swim session in that, uh, or a learn to swim session in that, uh, in that, in that pool. It's got the, uh, the booms can slide this way and that way along the pool and floors can lift up and down. The pool's got nine different moving booms and floors in, in, uh, in the 10 million litres of water that's in that pool environment. So it's, it's geared up with in, to in, in full response to the operator needs to get as much use out of that water constantly. And, um, you know, I've been round, had the benefit on these pools of looking round Liverpool, Manchester, Sheffield pools. Um, you know, Sheffield and Manchester got two 50 metre pools there and dive pools. And they are absolutely, it's incredible to see, they are flat out from 5.30 in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. Those lanes are, li literally lanes are booked and every half an hour for use. And uh, these, this will be a fantastic success in Legacy, I can assure you of that. Um, and, you know, it's... Again, another credit to this project for the, for the financial sustainability. And the, the, we've just had a very successful competitive uh, bid process for a, uh, an operator for this. We've already secured the operator in GLL for that, and we're just about to start working with them on the operator fit out now, to, so this pool gets ready and open to the community as early as we possibly can after the uh, Olympic Games. Thank you. I think there was a question at the back and then Thanks, a lady over here. Yeah, at the back and then over here. Thank you. Hi, um, Sylvie from Marks and Spencer. Um, 
Now that we have this fantastic building, I'm just wondering what are the plans for assessing the building's performance post-occupancy? Okay, yeah, start, I mean, I'll start yeah. with, I'm surprised about the sort of the controversy about, about the pool. I mean, we've, um, we've designed a very energy efficient swimming pool venue uh, and we've done uh, many things to make sure when an operator is on board that uh, their bills are, are manageable. I mean, in terms of operating, the building's been operated at the moment uh, and we've, we've got feedback already on, on energy use. Uh, we've been through one cycle of sort of making sure that's minimised. So pre-test events, we've shut systems down and there's already learning going on about how the systems are best operated. I think, um, I think really until we've got the, the facades in place uh, and we, we finish off the, the conversion is when the sort of work starts on measuring building performance. And a lot more now, and, and, and rightly so, there's a lot more uh, feedback on projects. Um, and of course, it's early days for that, but I would, I would expect that we would have some soft landing type <coughs> approach where we're, from day one, we're looking at um, measuring energy use and looking at optimising all the systems. The opportunities are there for the operators, and it's, but it's important that there's a real understanding about it. Energy costs in pools are a big part of the business case and keeping them down. I mean, for example, the, f the floors in the pools uh, can be raised and the evaporation losses from the pools can be significantly reduced. Uh, when water costs start becoming uh, more of an issue for us, uh, all the WCs, for example, are flushed by using backwash water from the pool filters. Um, so th there, are, there are factors in place and you know, we're really interested in getting involved in that when, when the building is into real operation. Can, can I just say something we might not have picked up? The, the, uh, the, bill, the, the whole development of the Olympic Park is uh, served by an energy centre. So there's a biomass boilers, CHP plant, chiller plant centrally to serve the future development platform, which is going to be the new um, Queen Elizabeth II Park of London, which is development plan for, by uh, the legacy company in the future. And this pool aids that by providing a load for the CHP plant, but also uses that very efficiently, that very efficient district heating system through uh, heat exchanger skids to uh, to heat all the pool water and provide the heating to the building. Sorry, I forgot that. It's pretty crucial. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, that, that is, yeah. Apart from that, okay. So that's where our heating load. That's where our heating comes from. Yeah. And then one at the front. So one, <laughs> two, three. Hi, Annie Duffield from Utime Youth Social Enterprise. Um, we've been given the Olympic and Paralympic Youth Awareness Initiative. So thank you, panel, for exciting and detailed presentations this morning. Really appreciated it. And congratulations on your achievements. Thank you, UK GBC and also Sangobang for this morning. Um, my question is, you touched on it in one of your presentations. Um, is this a London Games or is it a UK Games? And my young people, nationally, uh, perceive it as a Games for the UK. What are you doing now, following your achievements, to promote your achievement and this legacy and the Aquatic Centre nationally? OK, right, so, <laughs> sorry, the, the bit about the, OK, let's just touch on the London 2012 or UK 2012. That's, that's the way that's bid. It was bid as a city bid. It gives the mayor uh, powers over the over a lot of, a lot of influence over the development, uh, which is the Olympic Park for London, and uh, that is kind of a, the reason I mention that. It's a it's a political thing that tends to create a great deal of uh, issues for host nations, and uh, you see it time and time again that we. What I was trying to say is we got out of the starting blocks pretty early. It was Tony Blair and um, Ken Livingstone at the time managed to get a very quick agreement on what London was going to do and what the UK was going to do, put through a lot of powers in, through Acts of Parliament to, to secure the rights to, to develop this land and um, a load of other things that the IOC stipulate when you win a bid. And, um, and that, that was that set. You know, and, but time and time again, host nations get the, win the award of the Olympics and getting into a bit of infighting in their countries and it could be two or three years before they're even in that position. By that time, 
they've missed the, you know, they're, they're, then they start getting organised and they're really just chasing the clock. So it's just about getting the thing, getting the thing built to uh, save their reputation as a country. And that happens time and time again. So we're doing, we did it quite well politically at the start. Um, the, um, okay, the, so the Aquatic Centre, not just nationally, but internationally. So we, through the consultation process, I went around a lot of the pools around the UK. Um, we had extensive uh, help from Sport England and other bodies that do, you know, promote sport nationally in the UK. And um, they are obviously giving, feeding back the lessons and the education of the Dillerath and this pool to other, other designers and other pool providers. We've had the benefit of, you know, with uh, working on the design team, S&P Architects develop a lot of pools around the, around the country and around the, around the world. But the UK trade and industry and DTI are, do, um, they've done films, they're active promoting to all embassies, consulates, all developers all around the world. And um, what's stressing is, you know, sh no one should underestimate the amazing interest that the world's got on how we've delivered London 2012. Um, this whole idea about building for the legacy and, ca and efficiently and sustainably catering for the, the games in a, in a temporary fashion has really captured the world's imagination. So we've really changed the way that major sports events around the world are, are done. And, you know, we think about the Olympics once every four years. On the other side of the world, there's the Asian Games happening every four years, which is in a two-year cycle. There's the, the Commonwealth Games, there's the uh, FIFA World Cups, there's the uh, um, Winter Olympic Games, things happening. I mean, it's a, it's a continuous cycle going on. And uh, it was about six months ago, the IOC are based in Lucerne, and they brought back all their bidding nations that are bidding for any, any of these um, uh, events that I've just mentioned, and said, this is London, London's the model for future development of, uh, of uh, games, which says, so that they are focused on, you know, their, their whole idea was, when we won the bid, London won the bid on legacy, was that uh, they had realised, I don't think they could, um, you know, um, what's it, interpret it, or, what was I say, um, describe it as a sustainable way, but what, this, what their words was, their, their words were, were that they were, they were conscious of the fact they were moving into countries, building huge concrete structures that basically didn't have a life after the event, and they, they looked at, you know, Athens was a particular unfortunate example that basically was no use for those venues after, and they're now, you know, basically just about derelict, a lot of them but from Athens games, and um, they looked at that and thought, we can't do this as a, carry on doing this as a nation, and their view is to Basically, and that's something that we've started with our initiative, is build a flat pack Olympics, really, There's something like that. And they want to take that flat, the flat pack venues over down to the third world and really launch the third world and, and really get a sustainable flat pack solution on how you can host a, a games. And we've started that. You know, the stands on the, these games here, they're already sold. They're made of standard bits of steel that are reusable in the industry. They're, uh, Brazil are looking at taking them down and, re and reusing them in, in, in Rio, which would be fantastic <coughs> if that deal works. Loads of tax reasons and things like that that could nick up that, um, but um, you know this this is you know this, these stands are on the market for sale and reuse, so they're going to be taken down and reused, and if not, there's just standard um, you know materials that can be reused in the industry, but everything we've done on the park affects that. Thanks, Ian. Very conscious of time, we have I promise two quick two quick questions, two short answers, please. Um, uh, yeah, well, I think you just answered my question. Actually, I was asked to ask. Yeah, it's actually um, already sold to the suppliers who bought it. So we bought it in a way, it was like a, you know, it was a buy and sell back sort of thing, yeah. uh, deal on the post. So um, the steelworks supplier, the SPS uh, system, the seats are all, uh, they, they are actively promoting it. But we, as well, the government and ourselves, through just a contacts meeting Rio, for instance, have um, found some great opportunities and we're just pursuing those. We're at the tail end of pursuing those now. Fantastic, thank you. Lady at the front gets the final question. I'm Margaret Reynolds, architect, um, and I teach for Oxford Brookes University and do a lot of public speaking. Uh, there's been a lot of material printed, uh, it, uh, presented this morning that's quite accessible, really. Um, it's simplified. Will that be available on any public website, any of this? Because I would, you know, I would find it a, a good uh, starting point for just explaining that roof. You know, yeah. it's this in, well, we do the, 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 in, yeah, in, in, a, in, a, in a fairly um, amateur public arena. Um, I think it's, it'd be interesting to uh, be able to use some of this. 
Yeah, so we've, we're actively engaged in the called Lessons Learned Programme, and this is one of the series. There's ICE and other, other events going. I'm not sure what UKGBC is going to do, but it's quite normal to put these on a website, and I think they're videoing it. I don't know if the video is going to be on the website as well for view. Yeah. And there's also yeah. the Learning Legacy website now, the Learning Legacy the website. ODA, with also, a, a yeah. lot of uh, really useful information in it. So, right, we're going to have to wrap. Can I please thank our speakers? They've done a fantastic job today. Yeah.